Welcome back guys this is episode number 2 of Calm India Now the Calm India team tells me that this is a very special chair and I can use it to travel back in time So I'm going to go back 2.6 million years ago right before the first humans even appeared All right guys we've come back 2.6 million years ago There's still thousands of years left before the first humans even appear At this point I'm a monkey and let's imagine that I'm sitting in front of the river just appreciating the scenery I'm a monkey so I don't really have a job and I see this tree which is filled with bananas and since banana is my favorite fruit I start thinking about eating it Now the problem is there's also a tiger close by The moment there's this conflicting situation my mind like I mentioned in the last episode is going to start making certain calculations what are these calculations i'm going to figure out how hungry i am do i actually need these bananas i'm going to try to find out if the bananas are ripe enough to be had i also need to see if the tiger is actually asleep or if he's partially awake does it seem like the tiger just ate a meal and fell asleep so that even if i went to eat those bananas the tiger won't really do anything All of these calculations happen in fractions of seconds inside my head and millions of years of evolution has taught me to make the best possible calculations. Now, since I'm a monkey, I can't really pull out a piece of paper and start doing some calculations like 1 plus 1 is 5. Whatever. I'm a monkey. All of this happens internally. Let's let's think of it this way. There's a tiger and there are the bananas. in my head there is this fear meter right and i happen to be a balanced monkey so my fear meter is right here if my hunger is here which means that i'm a little bit hungry but i'm not going to starve if i don't eat today i'm going to make the decision that you know what it's too risky i feel really anxious about this situation i'm not going to go for the monkeys uh for the bananas on the other hand If I'm starving if my hunger is right up here my brain is going to give the output as hunger there's going to be no uh there's going to be no fear i mean i have the fear but the hunger is so overpowering that i'm not going to act on this i'm i'm thinking that since i'm starving i'm going to die anyway regardless of whether there's a tiger or not if i skip eating these bananas i'll just die of starvation so i'm going to take the risk I'm going to be ambitious because that's what my brain tells me to do. That's what the output is and I grab the bananas. This this balanced approach gives me a relative edge over some of my other cousins. My other cousins are the anxious monkey whose fear level is right up here. Even if he's really hungry, even if he's about to die and starve, he's so afraid that he won't actually make the move. He won't cross the river, run to the bananas and grab them and run he's just too anxious for it on the other hand i have another cousin who's the risky monkey his fear is right here he does not care about his life he's just if he wants something he's going to be really rash and go for it so is if his hunger is here he doesn't even need to eat the bananas urgently he's going to take the risk he's going to go run to the bananas and grab them even if the tiger is awake or there's a good chance that he might die now You might have heard of the phrase survival of the fittest. It actually comes from the scientific term called natural selection. Because of my behavior, most monkeys like me, the balanced monkeys are going to survive. Most of the anxious monkeys are going to starve and die, but a few of them purely by luck will survive. On the other hand, some of the risky monkeys, most of the risky monkeys are going to die because they'll be eaten by the tiger. but some of them just it just so happens will be lucky and they are going to live fast forward millions of years and we come back today as a result of these behaviors most people today have a balanced stress response and we still have some people who are way too anxious for for irrational reasons and on the other hand we have some people who are extremely rash who are extremely risk averse you see all of these crazy drivers on the roads who drive as if they don't care about their lives these are the risky monkeys and then you have the anxious monkeys 
Now, it's important for you to realize, connecting this back to our first episode, that there is a spectrum of anxiety. And this human calculator constantly is making these calculations and giving you outputs about uh, outputs that drive your behavior. In this episode, we're going to try to figure out how we can retrain your calculator. And you're going to see the four variables that actually affect all of your behavior and emotions. Let's get to that. A few thousand years after that banana event, our first true ancestors arrived on the planet, evolved directly from these primates and apes. And over the next two and a half million years, our brain, our calculator, kept becoming more and more refined, kept being able to deal with more complicated situations, giving us a huge edge over all of the other animals. Now, interestingly, despite the fact that we were extremely smart as compared to other animals, we were still hunters and gatherers. We were still looking for bananas and apples and hunting and living in small tribes and lighting fires at night to keep predators away. Interestingly, our modern society, the the kind of technology that enables this, the part of what you are right now, is extremely recent. About 12,000 years ago, the first fragments of modern civilization appeared. To give you an idea, let's, let's take this USB cord here. Imagine that this is all of the 2.5 million years. Out of this, our modern society has existed for this part. Now, why am I telling you this? The reason is that our calculators have helped us to survive in a very, very different environment. And all of a sudden, everything has changed, which is why modern society can be complicated for us. And it can give us wrong outputs sometimes. And this is where the point that I left you with in the first episode comes in. The best part about being human is that you can retrain your calculator to give you better outputs, to give you smarter outputs. Let's take the example of um, how behavior actually works in modern in the modern world. In order to understand behavior, we have to understand three other things which complete the cycle. Now there's behavior here, but there's also the environment that affects you. There are thoughts that are generated, which in turn generate emotions, which guides your behavior. To give you an example, let's take a guy called Akash. Akash is a 25 year old. He works in an office and he has now decided that Every day at 11 o'clock, he's going to fall asleep. He wants to have a better sleep cycle. He wants to have a healthier lifestyle. At 9.30, just according to plan, he's finished all of his work. He's finished dinner. He's about to kick back and relax. And he just wants to sleep. At 10 o'clock, he gets a call from work. By the time he ends up solving the whole thing, sending all the files that are required, it's almost 11. He's extremely stressed out and as a result of this, he thinks that I'm not going to be able to sleep. This is his thought. Because of this thought, he starts feeling anxiety and anger. The fact that he was not able to stick to his plan. This is the emotion. Now, when he gets up the next day, because he's not been able to sleep properly, because he went to sleep with that much stress, his behavior is going to be fundamentally altered. In fact, the fact that he was underslept yesterday will affect his behavior in such a way today that he gets more anxiety and then he sleeps even less. And this cycle keeps on going and this is the vicious cycle that a lot of people get into which we'll try to break. So how do we do this? So as we've discussed, for a majority of that 2.5 million year chunk, we were hunters and gatherers. We were still looking for those bananas and apples. We were really, really smart, much smarter than the animals. Nonetheless, this was our life. Now, it was at this stage that our stress response developed and gave us a huge edge while trying to survive predators. Imagine if that tiger actually attacked you in that banana situation or any other situation for that matter. The moment that happened, your body would go into what is known as the fight or flight response. There would be two hormones surging through your body. Adrenaline, which would help you either fight your predator or run away really fast, or and cortisol, after the event is over, 
when your muscles were tired and worn out, cortisol would come and heal them. And this is something that would happen a lot of times and it actually saved your life and was extremely relevant back then. So as you can understand, at a time of stress, which was when these two hormones would be triggered, you would be as awake as you possibly can. Linking this back to Akash, this was the reason he could not go back to sleep. When your body feels stressed out, it starts going into this fight or flight response and it completely prevents you from sleeping. So how do we figure these things out? How do we fix this? Let's examine those four points again. We had environment which led us to certain thoughts which generated emotions which ultimately guided behavior. Now out of these four, emotions are the hardest to control. The fact is that the moment you start feeling an emotion, especially in large quantities, whether it is happiness or anger or frustration or stress, it creates biochemical changes inside your mind. And those chemicals cannot just be removed. The only way to address emotions on an immediate basis is medication. And even when you do take medication, it actually reduces your fear response or your stress response in the moment. It doesn't actually make you happy. So that leaves us with three other points. Environment, thoughts, and, um, and behavior. We are going to cover these in the next episode in detail. Let's progress. Let's proceed forward and look at something called stress units, which are going to, which are going to help us understand the healthy limit of stress and anxiety that we discussed in the first episode. In order for us to understand the healthy limit of stress, we are going to, inve we are going to invent this thing called stress units. Let's assume that your body per day can accommodate 15 stress units, any more than that, and it starts having a negative effect on your health. Throughout your day, there are going to be stressful events. There are going to be some minor as well as major events. For minor, we are going to say that minor events give you one stress unit. Major ones give you three. Anything in the middle gives you two. Let's go through the typical day of someone who has a normal stress response. At the beginning of the day, um, I forget to pick up clothes from the laundry. I get one stress unit. Um, I can't find my keys. I, I feel like I may have lost them, but then I find them eventually. I go to office, it gets over, while on our way back we make a small trip. On the way we run out of petrol and we have to take a really long detour. Two more. Boss was in a really bad mood and he shouted at me. Three more. Now we've arrived at eight stress units and this is around the end of the day. Eight as you might be able to understand is a completely acceptable amount of stress for your body to take. Let's go through the same exact day. Except we'll explore the mind of someone who has, um, who has anxious or depressive disorders. I start my day and I forget to pick up clean clothes. One stress unit. God, I'm going to be wearing really awful clothes today. Will people judge me? Will I look silly? Two more. You know what? I, I don't have the confidence to pull off the clothes that I'm wearing. Two more. Why am I getting all of these negative thoughts? God, I'm just such a negative person in general. Two more. We are already at nine right now. Where are my keys? I can't find my keys. Ten. I'm just such a forgetful person. By this time, I'm really stressed out. Maybe I should not go to office today. One more. I take a leave. I can't believe I actually took a leave just because of my thoughts. Two more. My boss called and shouted at me because I took a leave. And it was completely uninformed and very random. Three. This is going to affect my career very negatively. I don't know what my future prospects are if this is the impression. Two more. All of my friends are back at the office so I can't really call anyone and talk to them. Two more. Now, so on and so forth. This can go on and this is just the beginning. First two or three hours of the day. And we are at 22 stress units already. The problem is that your body will happily manufacture cortisol and adrenaline as you keep feeling more and more stressed. There's something called the general adaptive syndrome, which is that when your body starts producing these hormones, 
in an increased quantity on a daily basis it starts thinking that perhaps this is what is required for my survival and it just gets used to making these more and more the what complicates this is the fact that the moment your body is trying to manufacture cortisol and adrenaline on a daily basis this happens at the cost of certain other neurochemicals which are really important for example serotonin or dopamine which control your mood and your happiness or dhea which is another important hormone inside your head so now not only is your body making more stress hormones it's also making fewer feel good hormones this means that over a period of time anything that costed you 0 or 1 stress units is now going to cost you 2 or maybe 3 and it is this huge stress response which results in this constant anxious or depressive state and let's not even forget that the original purpose of stress was to help you fight a predator or run away from one while in fact if you're standing still while feeling all of these emotions having this bodily stress response your heart is going to beat faster your breath will become shallow and you'll start feeling dizzy now this in turn is going to give you even more stress and so on and so forth there's this cycle that keeps getting started this brings us basically to the main purpose of this course which is that you understand where you lie on the stress scale you understand where your um how your stress response is working and try to modify it wherever your body has overcompensated we'll try to take our methods and reverse them with that we come to the close of our episode